Hello, everybody. Hey, and welcome to High Performance Housing, Better Homes for British Columbia, today's BC Sustainable Energy Association webinar. Uh, my name is James Glave, and I'm pleased to be guest hosting and emceeing today's proceedings. Um, I run a boutique communications firm based in Metro Vancouver, and I support companies and organizations that are working to advance the global low carbon economy. Uh, we're really pleased to see such a great turnout today. Uh, I'm especially pleased because this is a subject is a personal passion of mine. Uh, we've got more than 337 people registered today uh, with participation uh, from across the province and across the country and even a few overseas uh, guests as well. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm going to introduce our guests in a second, uh, but first I want to give a shout out to a couple of people who are here helping make this possible, including uh, Lor uh, Renee, I'm sorry, Renee Lorme Goldbranson, our administrative director. Uh, she's the magician behind the curtain. She's going to keep everything running smoothly, uh, ironing out any bumps as they come along, because after all, it's not a real webinar place some unless something goes a little sideways. Um, I also want to just thank uh, Executive Director Jessica McIlroy for inviting me to host today's program. Uh, Jessica's a real uh, pleasure to work with. Uh, so for those who may not be familiar with BCSCA, uh, this is an association of citizens, businesses, NGOs, uh, and academics who are working to accelerate the transition to the low carbon economy in British Columbia, Canada. We focus our work on public engagement and engagement uh, relating particularly to clean energy generation, uh, conservation and efficiency, the subject of today's uh, webinar, and low carbon transportation. Uh, you can find out more at bcsea.org. So today we're joined by guests, two guests who are experts in high performance housing standards and approaches, and I want to introduce them to you. Uh, first up, we'll have Gary Hamer, who is a specialist engineer with BC Hydro's Advanced DSM Strategy Group. Gary helps advance codes and standards in the residential sector here in BC. He serves as technical committee chair with the Canadian Standards Association, focusing on energy performance standards for residential equipment. Uh, he's also a council member and chair of the technical committee for the Canadian Home Builders Association's Net Zero Energy Homes Program, and he provides some support for the Energy Step Code Council, which oversees the new BC Energy Step Code, which we'll be hearing about uh, shortly. Welcome, Gary, to uh, today's show. Thanks, James. Okay, cool. Uh, I also want to uh, introduce Bob Deeks. Bob is the president of RDC Fine Homes. Uh, RDC is a builder. They build and renovate homes and they specialize in sustainable, healthy, high performance buildings. Um, they completed uh, BC's first net zero energy home back in 2010. Uh, and they're one of the first builders in the province to adopt Silk Green and Energy Star uh, certification label programs. Um, Bob is also currently the vice chair of the Net Zero Energy Council, Housing Council, I'm sorry, of the Canadian Home Builders Association. And say hello, Bob. Hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, great. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Uh, so uh, just a quick note about what we're going to be covering, and then we're going to get right into it. Um, so over the course of this hour, we'll be opening the door and looking inside the walls, uh, peeking inside the mechanical rooms uh, to learn about what are some of the key characteristics and elements of a high performance home? What is a high performance home and why is it important? Why does it matter? Um, Bob and Gary will bring us up to speed on a variety of different green building programs and standards. And one of them uh, is brand new, the BC Energy Step Code, uh, which the province uh, very recently just signed into regulation. Uh, it's a new standard that allows, uh, that, aim, uh, that, aims, uh, that aims to create new buildings. Uh, it does that by establishing measurable uh, energy efficiency requirements for new construction. So here's how it's going to work. We're going to do some presentations uh, from Bob and Gary. Uh, Bob and Gary and I will have a little bit of chat about what we've heard, and then we're going to go to questions uh, from all of you out there who are listening in today. Uh, we'll also be hitting it up with a couple of on-screen polls, uh, so be sure to watch for those uh, as they appear. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. This webinar will be available to our members after the fact is recording. If you're not a member of BCSEA, BCSEA uh, you're going to want to get on that right away. Uh, and it allows the organization to offer great programming like what we're enjoying today. I'm a member myself, and you should be too. So, so there. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, uh, asking questions. That's going to be a big piece of this. We really want to hear what you um, want to know about high performance homes. 
um, just use that control panel that should be on your screen, uh, the GoToWebinar control panel, and make sure you select Ask a Question uh, in the drop down. You can ask a question at any time. I'm going to be nudging you several times throughout um, the presentations. Um, and we'll get to them when we get to the Q&A period in the second half of the uh, presentation. Um, last but not least, uh, this webinar has been made possible with the support of BC Hydro, uh, and we're grateful for that support. So thank you. Uh, and with that out of the way, I'm going to let Gary uh, take the controls and uh, take us through his uh, presentation. You ready to go, Gary? I am. Thank you, James, and thanks for the opportunity of presenting at uh, BC SEA. Um, this presentation has evolved a little bit just in re with recent developments, so I'll be uh, touching on a bit more of the energy step code than uh, we thought we'd be allowed to. We've been waiting um, with bated breath for the uh, code to be signed into legislation, and it was done just on Friday. So um, that's very exciting work for the people that have been involved with it. Uh, Bob and I have both been involved for a couple of years now, so uh, it's good news. Um, so uh, James has already covered this off. Um, Bob, you can see his smile and face there, and um, some of the, his credentials, um, just to get an idea of what I look like, and then we'll move quickly on. <clears throat> but um, so what we're wanting to talk about is beyond code. Uh, people have a, a perception that. Um, code is as good as it gets. Um, well, that's not in in fact the case. Um, we do have a, a code, a build, building code that um, is follows the national standards and BC it, um, slightly changes it for our requirements here. And it has advanced with energy efficiency over the years, but um, as uh, one of the folks that has been working in high performance housing for quite a while, Richard Kodelsky noted, that it's um, the minimum you can legally build to. And so you can do much better than that. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So one of the things that uh, we note when you go into a new home, uh, real estate agents are uh, quick to tell you about the neighborhood or some of the uh, features in the kitchen or um, uh, open living spaces and so on. But often what's missing is what's behind the scenes. So how well has um, the builder gone, to, what lengths have they gone to to construct the home to better than code requirements? And so part of that is measuring their performance. And so here on the bottom, you see a blower door uh, test being conducted. And the upper um, picture in the center is um, uh, a building wrap that provides air tightness um, for the home. And so I wanted to uh, talk about um, Curtis and his family, uh, who um, many of us can relate to. A uh, very proud owner of a 1929 home and uh, making it his uh, home with his family. Um, and since 1929, you might recognize that um, actually refrigerators came uh, in a big way. It shows that this refrigerator is pretty upscale. It's got a radio built into it. But some of the other <laughs> things that we might have happened um, in this home is that we changed out the fixtures and uh, had some wonderful colors uh, in the fixtures or um, shag carpeting uh, probably came and went uh, during the time that this home was originally constructed. Of course the kitchen probably uh, had a couple of iterations and perhaps today it looks something like this. But with all those changes, the cosmetic changes I'll call it, um, one of the things that um, never really um, uh, was recognized until Curtis moved into the house, was this home had absolutely no insulation. And so it was <clears throat> very cold and uh, drafty, as you might well imagine, uh, during the winter time. And so what um, we want to focus on is the, the things that uh, need to be done when the house is being built, because you'll never get a chance to go back and fix them. And so that's envelope first approach and so and then if we look if i could just if i can just jump in here you know it's a very important consideration because even a modern house built today to the building code doesn't necessarily mean that the thermal performance of the envelope itself has been all that well done because you can't see it so um it's it's really good to understand who 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 built the house uh, or if you're going to hire a builder 
make sure you really understand how they're going to build it so you get what you uh, originally are anticipating with regard to energy performance. Yeah, those are good points, Bob. Um, so when we talk about high performance housing, uh, as Bob pointed out, you can't necessarily see it, but often you can feel it. And so it, with um, a conventionally built home, they may have warm and cold spots throughout the home. And with high performance homes, we're looking for optimal thermal comfort. And that means that it's uh, the same temperature at the top of the ceiling as it is at the floor, uh, in the back room as well as the living room. Um, the, in a conventional home, you might have uncontrolled leakage, which has telltale signs of dirt along the edges of the carpets where air is rushing in from a ledger plate or, um, and it's leaving the dirt behind that uh, is coming in with that uh, air or as the air leaves the home. And with a high performance home, you have continuous ventilation. You have a tight home that requires uh, continuous ventilation balanced um, as much air is leaving as is coming in. You'll also have a quieter home because um, you're likely to have higher uh, thermal performance and that also adds up to uh, better noise reduction. And often the windows that um, you put into your home are higher performance and therefore reduce the amount of noise from the outside. Code-built home will often have heating systems that cycle on and off uh, early. Bob will touch a little bit about that later in his presentation about right-sizing heating systems. Um, High-performance homes also uh, have a minimal amount of maintenance to them uh, because they've been thought out a little bit better than, uh, say, a code-built home might have been. They also uh, enjoy lower energy bills. That means that greenhouse gas emissions are often reduced as well as the carbon footprint for the home. In a code-built home, you might end up with condensation on the windows and higher energy bills. So there's many standards in the market today and it can, can create confusion as to what is a high performance uh, building. So there's a range of programs and approaches and often it's inconsistent from one program to another is, is uh, does something indicate that it's um, energy efficient or not? Some of the programs that you're probably familiar with include Energy Star and R2000, um, LEED for um, homes and buildings, and Passive House. Um, excuse the logos have been updated in some cases, but that's kind of the lay of the land. There's a lot of things that builders can choose from. And so one of the things that with the uh, step code is that it's going to reduce some of that confusion. This was set up by the Building Act, which um, ensures that there's consistency in approaches between municipalities. There's competency uh, requirements where <clears throat> authorities having jurisdiction or building inspectors uh, need will be professionalized and um, need to be members of the building uh, BC um, Builder Officials Association and uh, allows for innovation and so there will be an advisory committee which can help builders um, uh, allow, uh, get um, something that's new uh, passed through building codes without um, a particular building official kind of going out on a limb for it. So there'll be a central advisory group which will uh, periodically look at um, some of the innovative uh, solutions that might be coming forward. This is going to be um, in place at the end of uh, this year and that will uh, bring an end to local building requirements uh, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about um, shortly. This process is also bringing some new tools and opportunities into the marketplace. Um, this is also falls in line with BC's climate leadership plan, which has stated that by 2032, um, all homes will build, be built to a net zero ready uh, level. Um, this um, also allowed, uh, the climate leadership plan also talked about stretch codes. They've now been renamed to uh, step codes, but it's the same thing where local governments can choose a particular tier that uh, suits their requirements. 
and it also the uh, climate leadership plan also looked at the climate action charter as well so um, in order to um, develop this energy step code there were a lot of organizations that came together it included um, local governments and professionals developers utilities uh, and of course the province was the main lead in that you can see uh, some of the membership there <clears throat> Uh, professional associations and home builders and the utilities. BC Housing played a big role in it as of course did the province with their uh, building safety standards branch. So this was approved on Friday as I mentioned and uh, with it is uh, now that um, some um, logos and so on that will go along with identifying this energy step code <clears throat> as they uh, identified it, building beyond standard. This is what it looks like uh, at a, um, a quick glance. I, I should uh, uh, make uh, it evident that this is an envelope first approach, mechanical second, so it's not that we want to avoid technology solutions. Uh, going back to Curtis's ho a 1929 home the thermal envelope needs to be addressed first. We know that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to go back and redo those types of things, uh, make a building in uh, tighter or, or things along those lines. So envelope first, mechanical second. You'll see that the foundation is the BC building code. Everything builds off that. The first step is what we're calling enhanced compliance. <clears throat> it's um, using a performance-based approach, so rather than a prescriptive approach, uh, builders need to um, model their homes in HOT 2000 um, and use the services of an energy advisor to do that. That um, HOT 2000 uh, modeling run will then show compliance with the building code and there's enhanced, enhanced compliance which um, will do such things as <clears throat> requiring uh, proof of proper size heating systems, so a detailed heat loss analysis, detailed duct design, hopefully that'll come about, as well as um, commissioning of equipment, which, you know, if you, you can have a great design, but if the equipment wasn't installed um, as it's intended, your design is going to fail. So going above that, step two is 10% better than code. And, and so, uh, the intent there is the thermal performance of this building will reduce your energy consumption over a reference home built to code by 10%. Similarly, step three is 20% better than code. Step four is 40%. And the fifth tier um, is, um, it was originally thought to be aspirational, but we do know that homes are now being built uh, to net zero levels, as Bob pointed out, he had uh, the first one built in the province. <clears throat> and so homes that uh, build to a certification program, such as the CHBA's <clears throat> net zero program or passive house uh, program, um, can attain that tier. And it's happening at a fairly rapid rate uh, in the province already. So the um, Municipalities can choose which tier they want to work um, with. They might use, uh, for instance, um, City of North Vancouver has uh, is using tier four and above <clears throat> for rezoning of a particular district. So what that is trying to do is create a consistent and predictable approach from trying to consolidate all the programs that are currently in the marketplace into something that is a bit more understandable. You can see on the uh, step code that there are some logos, uh, built green Energy Star R2000 and passive and net zero. Um, <clears throat> that's not, it, we're still working out the details as, as to if a home is certified to a particular program, will they meet that tier? Um, we're, that's the hope that um, something like that will be worked out. Excuse me. Um, so there are similar programs already in existence. Um, 
you know, tier one uh, Whistler and New West are doing something where they're uh, providing in incentives to um, energy advisors. Similarly, uh, step two is occurring in those um, different municipalities, which is roughly Energuide 80. Energy stars uh, being adopted by Richmond, Surrey, and the city of North Van, and um, <clears throat> also the city of North Van and some rezoning applications are uh, looking to um, net zero or passive levels. So the, the goal is um, we've attracted national attention, um, which is good news. Um, natural Re uh, Research Council, which um, looks after the codes, <clears throat> Codes Canada, um, is interested in what BC is doing, and they're using that as the base for uh, their discussions on how they can incorporate steps into the national code that will um, undoubtedly be volunteer at um, first but the, the hope is that this kind of step code approach will be uh, um, provided um, by the national um, codes council and <clears throat> would be available for a province to pick it up if they um, wanted to not all provinces will but some of the leaders in the country um, certainly, if you look at uh, Maritimes, Nova Scotia has got a lots of high-performance homes going on. Uh, Ontario's code is um, above British Columbia's current code, but uh, BC is definitely a leader with the uh, energy step code. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Bob now. Hello, everyone. Uh, so to just allow everything to move smoothly here, Gary will uh, move the slides forward. Uh, we've already talked about uh, various steps uh, that are being that that have been brought into uh, the step code there, um, and so uh, what we um, are really looking for uh, is uh, a collaborative approach with the step code that would uh, allow capacity building in the industry uh, and uh, promoting education. So, for example, if today, uh, say, the city of Kamloops were to decide that they even wanted to go to step code one for all the permits that uh, would come through in a year, we actually don't have the capacity uh, for the professionals to be able to uh, do the documentation for those permit applications. Uh, so one of the, um, the goals of the step code is to adopt this uh, selectively in various places around the province so that we can start to bring capacity in for the professionals that will be required to support the development of the uh, step code program, moving us towards this goal of being uh, net zero ready by 2032 for all buildings. The other really important uh, component here is to educate everyone. So while we do have um, a small number of builders in the province right now who are familiar with building all the way up to a net zero standard or a passive standard, the average builder really is still struggling in some ways to understand the new energy requirements that were brought in two years ago. And so by allowing municipalities to selectively enhance the requirements for energy within the code, uh, it not only um, starts to introduce this to a broader group of builders, but it helps to uh, educate the, um, the staff within those municipalities, the building inspectors, the plan checkers, um, so that they understand where we need to go with regards to reducing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then of course, uh, the idea here is that everybody's working together, uh, building to a similar standard, whether you're on uh, step code one or step code five. Next slide. So uh, picking up on the education component, uh, the federal government realized that they could have some impact here to try and uh, teach builders in the various provinces what some of the new technologies were and allow them an opportunity to do uh, an analysis of those technologies um, and then hopefully leading through to builders starting to adopt um, some, some new technologies and this was what was referred to as the, uh, the LEAP process and uh, Gary and I both participated uh, in um, a LEAP uh, group in the Lower Mainland BC Hydro, of course, was one of the presenting sponsors, and I was lucky enough to be one of the builders. Um, at the very first meeting, uh, we got, uh, Gary, how many? We were um, about 20, 20 builders together in the room? Uh, yeah, actually, Lower Mainland was uh, 13. Thir 13 we builders got, in the room? Yeah, we've uh, gone to a slightly 
expanded uh, scale in the interior where we, we include uh, upwards of 100 builders in each session now. And so what we were given the opportunity to do was to consider uh, a very, very broad range of technologies uh, at the first meeting, um, over 40 uh, as demonstrated in the slide here. And from that meeting, uh, the builder group uh, uh, chose 12 new technologies or new technologies for builders in the room um, that they wanted to do an in-depth review on. Uh, so the staff at NRC went away. Uh, they did some analysis, uh, some cost-benefit analysis of the 12 technologies. They brought them back into meeting two. And the builder group uh, um, considered those and boiled it down to uh, five technologies that everybody really was making a commitment to trying out uh, in a house that they would build once the lead presentations were over. And those five uh, technologies uh, were then presented by the various manufacturers. And what we were looking for was not so much as a sales presentation, we wanted a technical presentation so we could really understand what the benefits of those technologies would be to our clients or to the houses that we built. Um, and then coming out of those, each of the builders was invited to choose one to four of those technologies and incorporate them into a house. And our company uh, took, uh, I think, four of the technologies and we actually incorporated them into three of our next projects. Next slide. So, you know, one of the things that can be very confusing, uh, not only for the consumer, but uh, even for the builder is the, you know, vast uh, array of different options that go into making a high performance house. And you can just see on the slide here, you know, we've, we've, we've got highlighted, there's six different wall options here. There's seven different windows, uh, five different domestic hot water heating solutions. Uh, and then if you, you, you combine all those, you end up with 129 million different possibilities or 129 million different options that one could choose from uh, to try and uh, optimize the energy performance of the house. And what LEAP really did for us was to boil that down so that it made that choice a little bit easier. And so when you model this, uh, if you look uh, on the graph here, you can see that uh, the, um, the amount of energy used is on the vertical graph and the cost scale uh, is on the horizontal graph. And so you can see that uh, you can spend an enormous amount of money. If you look up into the sort of top right-hand quadrant of the, the graph, you can spend a lot of money and actually not get um, uh, a huge uh, increase in performance. Or you can spend uh, a little bit of money and you can actually achieve really, really high um, increases in energy performance and thermal comfort and all those other benefits. And, so the education process for the builder group and particularly LEAF was critical to allowing us to uh, figure this out. So, you know, what is a high performance home? Um, uh, sorry, uh, so what this did is it allowed us to very, very quickly uh, identify what were the most affordable technologies that were right for where we built and for our clients to try and achieve this uh, standard of a better built house. Next slide. And so this was uh, the pick list of the, I think the 12 technologies that we originally considered and the five um, or the seven technologies that we eventually had presentations on were windows, uh, exterior insulation or foam sheathed exterior walls, um, photovoltaic or solar electrical generation systems for the roof, um, new uh, air source uh, heat pump technology, which Typically, you might uh, look at us for your air conditioning, but can also produce heat. Uh, different types of uh, exterior insulation, such as mineral wool. Uh, different um, uh, heating systems, heating and domestic hot, water, domestic hot water systems, which are referred to as combination space and water heating systems. And uh, low capacity furnaces are small furnaces that would be specifically designed for energy efficient houses. Next slide. So the presentations that we received were uh, uh, specific to the technical and cost benefits uh, that each, um, uh, each type of product uh, would offer to the builders. And on the slide here, we have two examples. One is uh, mineral wool exterior insulation, and the other uh, one is the cold climate air source heat pump. 
Next. Sorry, Bob. I didn't realize that I was had some action items here. No oh, action items. That's awesome. So you know what was important uh, for the builder group is you know we're we're all fairly risk adverse. Uh, we want to know about technologies that are proven uh, uh, will work well in our on our our climate zones or where we build. We want to know how much it's going to cost because of course as the consumer you know you're very very focused on uh, the affordability quotient and we don't want to engage in technologies that just are cost prohibitive prohibitive. Uh, the analysis also uh, identified what was the energy saved and actually how much did it cost for each gigajoule of energy saved. So that made a really interesting comparison metric. Um, and then really understanding how would this impact how we typically built a house? What changes would we need to make to our construction practices? How much education would we need to engage with in our trades? Next slide. So one of the uh, really interesting outcomes from uh, the LEAP uh, Builder Group in Vancouver was a recognition that heating equipment can play an enormous role in how comfortable your house is, uh, both in terms of the thermal comfort, but humidity levels and also the durability. Um, and we all, uh, all of a sudden discovered that there is a, a CSA standard um, called F280, which had been uh, brought into the BC Building Code in 2012. And simply what this standard uh, is for is to make sure that your heating equipment, your furnace, uh, is sized correctly, not only for the size of the house, but for how much uh, energy you need, need to heat and cool it. Um, and when we went through an exercise, uh, we discovered that the vast majority of uh, builders in the room who were uh, what we would all uh, recognize as being high performance builders or builders who uh, had an understanding of energy efficiency and we're building um, a better than code house. None of us uh, really understood um, the heat loss calculation. And we discovered that most of us were installing furnaces that were up to 400 times, uh, 400 percent larger um, than was required. Um, what this standard requires us to do is to make sure that we um, engineer and design our systems properly. Uh, and then there's a requirement um, or a consideration to make sure that once the system is installed, that it has been uh, set up properly so that it delivers on the original promise from the manufacturer. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the end result was uh, we all went and, and picked some technologies. Uh, our company uh, picked uh, four technologies that we tested on three houses. Uh, some of the things that we were really interested in is we were interested in that right-sized furnace. Uh, one of our projects, uh, we uh, tendered it out. Um, we got our HVAC contractor, our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning contractor to specify for us what the size of the furnace was that they would recommend for the house. They came back and said that they would put in a, a 50,000 BTU furnace, and BTUs is just a measurement of how much heat it puts out. When we did the calculation through the F280 standard, we discovered that a 15,000 BTU furnace was all we needed. So it really, really highlighted how important it was to make sure that we were doing these calculations and that we were right sizing uh, the mechanical equipment into the house. Um, and so for anybody who uh, is looking to build a new house, uh, this is a very important question to ask your builder is to make sure that they are doing a calculation to calculate um, how much heating and how much cooling the house needs, and that it is matched up to the heating and ventilation contractor's specification for equipment. Uh, interestingly, one of, the, uh, one of the technologies we looked at was a Canadian manufacturer, um, and actually one of the only manufacturers in Canada that uh, produces a small right-sized furnace. Uh, some of the other technologies we used, it was uh, triple glazed windows, we actually uh, tested out a combination, domestic hot water uh, and um, hot water heating system. Uh, and we also did uh, a project where we tested out exterior insulation where uh, instead of just putting fiberglass into our wall cavities, we also added uh, an exterior rigid type insulation like Styrofoam SM or, um, uh, uh, or uh, that white expanded polystyrene uh, insulation to the outside of the building. And that actually was one of the most, the two things that were the most successful for us were the uh, exterior insulation, which we've now 
taken on as uh, our standard uh, wall construction assembly um, and the right size furnace. Next slide. So one of the things I thought would be great to touch on was uh, the Energuide rating scale um, and the changes that we have seen just recently uh, to Energuide. Uh, anybody who is going to model a house or test a house for energy efficiency would put it through a software program that would produce an Energuide label. And some of you may recognize the label from a house. Uh, of course, we would all recognize particularly the label on the left um, as something we would see uh, on, a, on an appliance such as a dryer or a dishwasher. Um, and the old label was a scale from zero to 100. The higher the number, uh, the less energy the house would use. And it was an exponential scale. So uh, as you moved up the scale, your energy save, you, it, the, the, every time you gained a point and you went from 80 to 81, you would experience greater and greater energy savings. So recently, uh, the Energuide label has been changed. So rather than a sliding scale of some ambiguous number, 70, 80, 100, uh, we've gone to an Energuide rating that measures how much energy the house would actually use. And so you can see, if you look at the label closely, there's the arrow kind of in the middle there that says 122. So 122 would represent um, the house that you're building in the building code, how much energy would that house use? So the building code would suggest that house would use 122 gigajoules of energy a year. Um, the house that hey, you're- Hey, Bob, it's James just uh, checking in. Just mentioning that we've got uh, questions pouring in and we're kind of eating away uh, at our time. So if you could get to uh, wrap up this presentation, we can move on to those. So sorry to interrupt, just wanted to do a time check that uh, uh, we, should, we, should, we should wrap it up. Yeah, we're very close to the end. Awesome. Okay. So this was the first um, net zero label that was produced uh, in Canada. Case would use in comparison. Oh, sorry, Bob. Sorry, Derek. You were cutting out yeah. There. Carry on. Okay. Yeah. The audio. The audio is a little in and out here. Uh, next slide. There you uh, go. And there we go. There you go. Wow. Perfect. Forty minutes. That's okay. good, Gary. Like we practiced. <laughs> yeah, you guys are. Uh, that's some fascinating uh, information that you've gotten across here, and you you went we went deep on it, which is great. So um, I know that there's a there's quite a few questions that I'm I'm trying to choose from, but a couple of things came up for me right off the top, um, and uh, I just wanted to check in with you first. Um, also wanted to mention to our participants that uh, the first of two polls is going to be coming up on your screen shortly, uh, so we'd love to get your take on that. Um, British Columbia set a goal that all new buildings must be net zero ready by 2032. Uh, and just let us know if you think this is a realistic goal or not ambitious enough or just about right. So, uh, so Gary Ball, I'm going to throw this to both of you. I'm curious if there's any barriers in the existing code uh, that are really holding back implementation um, on a voluntary basis of, of any of these high performance um, tools or techniques or approaches to, uh, to, home, uh, to home building. Who wants to take a Gary, stab at that? Gary, do you want me to take a stab at that first? Sure. So one of the advantages of the new building act that we have in the province of British Columbia, as Gary had identified, is it'll create a mechanism whereby uh, if a new technology uh, is available to the building community, we should, if, if, it, if, if it's a viable technology, it's been properly tested, um, we should be able to adopt that technology a little bit quicker. Uh, in the province of British Columbia and that the decision around whether you would be able to use that technology is centralized with the provincial government as opposed to becoming the responsibility of the individual building inspectors. And so in the past there have been uh, some barriers to uh, achieving higher levels of performance in houses as a result of the responsibility falling to the individual municipalities uh, and so that's an important step forward. Um, generally the code in and of itself uh, doesn't create a barrier to building a better house because a big part of uh, building a better house or building a more energy efficient house is better attention to detail and more insulation. Cool. Um, so another thing, I'm, I'm oh, Gary, did you want to address that briefly as well? 
Yeah, I, I would actually. Um, I think that one of the exciting things for me with the energy step code is it kind of brings all the elements together. Um, Bob mentioned um, F280 is um, a standard that is used for measuring heat loss uh, calculations in a home. Um, what this energy step code has done is by scrutinizing higher performance levels, it will not, not only identify some of the challenges that we might have um, with, say, bylaws that are getting in the way of, um, of builders wanting to uh, build higher performance homes, but it also points out some of the deficiencies that we might have with standards that uh, are lagging. So this kind of wraps it all together nicely so that um, we're looking at it from a very holistic perspective. Cool. All right, so I'm going to get um, to some of the questions then that have come in uh, from our audience. Uh, we have a question from uh, Luke Damron, and uh, Luke's curious, how do we uh, incentivize people to pay for uh, greener uh, and more efficient technologies, assuming that there is a, a cost premium associated with those, uh, when we have such affordable electricity, such cheap electricity, and it's also very clean? Uh, there's a long payback period in both money and in carbon. So anybody want to take that one on? Yeah, I, Maybe can I, I start off? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that as part of the energy step code, we've got a metrics project that um, uh, we're looking at right now, and that <clears throat> is doing a detailed analysis of um, what it would take to get to these different tiered levels um, using some archetypes that are um, often built in, in our marketplace. And so we're looking at small, medium, and large homes, we're looking at duplexes and sixplexes and um, um, multi-family homes of um, all sizes. And we're looking at what the incremental cost is to eat, uh, move up on the, each of these tiers. And what um, the report should be uh, um, finished by the end of this month, but uh, I'm really encouraged by the early results is that uh, we're seeing that um, the incremental cost um, is often, um, even to get to the highest tier, is often only in the order of about 5%. Um, and so if you look at it cost effectively about adding more costs to your mortgage versus what the operating costs are, um, there is an economic case in, in many of the uh, tier levels uh, for those incremental costs for higher performance. Cool. Bob? lost Gary's audio I just finished um, go ahead Bob. He finished so if you wanted to address that Bob uh, briefly I want to move yeah, on so, to the questions but I, th I think there's another important component here is because well um, uh, we do see that if you're careful the cost and I know we're not answering the question specifically uh, around incentives but I think that What's really important is people consider what are the other benefits that you get from building an energy efficient house, because uh, when you build a house in the way that we're talking about, you get dramatically improved thermal comfort, evenly warm in every room, same temperature, uh, evenly cool in the summertime. We get a house that uh, is durable. Uh, we're reducing airflow through the walls, so we're reducing moisture issues, we're providing optimized indoor air quality, reducing condensation. The house is quieter, it's uh, more dust free. And generally when we talk a high performance house, we can talk in some of the same languages that we refer to for a high performance car. And while people will pay 100% more for a high performance car, uh, what we see is if you're careful, you can get to a step code three, level three house very easily for as little as you know, two and a half to 5% increase in the overall cost of the house. So the cost increase is not, an, is not significant. Um, and the benefits outside of energy efficiency can be uh, dramatic. Sounds like a high performance home practically sells itself. <laughs> no, that's, that's great well, to hear you uh, detail all of the, uh, all of the benefits there. Yeah. And sometimes um, it does. A, a well, bunch of folks are, yeah. Sorry. Okay, good. So a number of, uh, of our participants, uh, including Guy Doncey, who is the founder of the BCSCA, nice to hear you out there, Guy, um, are, are, uh, are wondering, uh, you know, why aren't we moving to net zero uh, standard across the board now? 
the, you know, it's a 2032 target. That was our poll question. Uh, and I hope to see some results uh, uh, shortly on that. Uh, oh, and by the way, I just got those results and most people feel it's about right. So um, others think that uh, are clearly yeah. saying that we need to be moving more quickly. Uh, any, any take on why we, why we can't go to that now? I could, Bob, I do you want to take a first that? shot at that? Yeah. So one of the comments that I made is that the purpose of the step code is to build capacity. Uh, so right now, if we went to a net zero ready standard, we actually don't have the resources in place to do the energy modeling for every permit that would be required in the province of British Columbia. Um, and then the other, even more important uh, point of this is that we did, we don't have the we don't have the education base. Um, the building officials don't understand um, how these houses really are put together. They don't understand how to check the building permit drawings and they don't understand how to inspect them to make sure they meet the code requirement. And the builders don't understand properly how to do this and neither do the trades. Uh, we had a fairly modest increase in energy efficiency in the last building code upgrade a couple of years ago. Uh, and even today, two years out, uh, the industry is still struggling to understand what the implications and consequences are of this to their business and to the houses that they build. And so that's why we have the step code here uh, is to allow people to gradually dip their toe in the water of high performance housing and energy efficiency uh, and gradually uh, get to know how to do this properly. Because the last thing we want to do is we, we don't want to go back to the consequences of what we termed as the leaky condo crisis where we had fairly significant changes both in building design uh, and um, uh, energy efficiency requirements, uh, and it created a lot of very badly damaged buildings. So building capacity and education is a key if we're going to achieve this by 2032. And then, of course, there is the issue of housing affordability. So while I can blithely say that you know, the cost to get to a step code three building is only 25 to 5% more than a standard build house, there are a lot of people out there that that would uh, eliminate them from the housing market altogether. And so we need to move at this carefully uh, and consider the cost and um, the long-term consequences of what we're doing. Gary, do you want to take a stab at that? No, I think Bob pretty well summed that up. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'm curious, um, you know, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, you know, many of the existing green building programs such as Energy Star are voluntary. Uh, the energy step code is voluntary for any local government that wants to pick it up and use it. Um, why is it important to have uh, performance, energy efficiency uh, and built into, into policy, into the, into the baseline code? Is it? Well, I, maybe I'll start there with, um, you can't, you can't uh, determine where you are until you measure it. And that's one of the big foundations of the uh, energy step code is um, getting homes modeled so that we're not so we understand uh, where the baseline is for the billing code and where th what the performance level of this particular home is and so um, and that goes to the label that was uh, shown earlier um, providing an enter guide label so that there is some confidence um, by the uh, home owner or home buyer that they are getting um, what they're paying for in the way of energy efficiency. The um, there it will be a, a while before uh, municipalities adopt it. As I mentioned, there are some that are uh, surging forward, but um, it, it goes back to Bob's comment about building capacity and um, for um, programs, whether they're volunteer or not, just so that um, what. You know, I mentioned earlier that what really excites me about um, energy uh, step code is that it integrates so many of the elements. And it's we've talked uh, for many years about integrated design for uh, home construction, but it, it really hasn't happened. And I'm hoping that that energy step code will be the first step so that uh, the different trades involved in uh, building a home understand their role in it so that plumbers won't make a hole unnecessarily in the external wall because it has big implications on the air leakage rates. Um, little details like that. And then, yeah, there's two components to this. Uh, you know, one is the, is the planning process and the goal setting around what do we want to achieve, um, but we also have to test. And so when we're 
uh, on a performance-based path, not only are we modeling it to uh, really know, you know what the outcome is going to be, but then we also test against it. And for our company, uh, our greatest learning outcomes have always been when we test what we build. Cool, okay, right on. Uh, I'm curious how you mentioned um, a little bit earlier that the, um, uh, the National Research Council, Gary, uh, is, is interested in the BC Energy step code. Uh, and you also cited a couple examples from the Maritimes, but I'm, I'm curious if, um, you know, how, how BC compares or with these other jurisdictions and maybe with, uh, on, with US jurisdictions um, in terms of the requirements that are built into, into the code. Are we, uh, are we about on par with others? Are we ahead? We have this reputation as a green, uh, a green region. I don't know if it follows through in this built environment. Well, what struck me when I moved from the prairies to the <clears throat> coast is that um, there was two things. Uh, we don't have cold weather and we don't have bugs. And so when I moved into my first <laughs> home, um, I didn't have screens and um, it also had far less insulation than my prairie home. And so I was uh, cold and drafty and I had an enormous number of bugs in the house. And so I think because of um, our climate and we've never really been concerned uh, about uh, energy um, and how much we used it. Um, go back to Curtis's example that I started with. And um, you know there were very few building envelope failures because heat just radiated out of the house every which way. And so as you build to a higher performance level, you have to take care in ensuring that you don't have uh, unintended consequences arising. Um, so I would say from a policy perspective, British, British Columbia is one of the, is the leader in the country. Uh, and that's why NRC wants to look to us. From a practical perspective, I take a look at the Maritimes and they've been building to the R2000 level for many years. A large part of that is because they have much higher energy costs than we do. Um, I'm curious, um, and uh, we had a question about this uh, in terms from uh, from Elena Dopfer. She's curious about uh, what what, the, what is the uh, training process involved? You mentioned that there's a, a capacity and skills uh, shortfall, and we want to move uh, carefully along the steps of the energy step code um, to not get too far ahead of uh, what the market can support. Where, where where are builders learning about this? Do they go to workshops? Is that been built into the plan? Um, is this being done through the trades uh, institutes? Tell us a little bit about what's happening on that front. You want me to take that one, Gary? Sure, start with it. Uh, so um, in British Columbia, uh, actually fairly recently, uh, there is a requirement for all builders to be licensed, and uh, we have recently now adopted a requirement that all builders have to meet a certain level of education component. And so every licensed builder in the province is required to do continuing professional development each year. They have to satisfy a certain number of credits to be able to renew their license. And so this is creating some motivation uh, for builders to learn uh, um, more about high performance building strategies. Uh, and then of course, um, as a result of having mandatory education, there are now numerous uh, uh, organizations that are delivering a wide variety of education. Uh, some of it comes from places like BC Hydro, uh, BC Housing also supports an enormous amount of education delivery specific to how to build a better house. And then of course, when we look at the step code, uh, recognizing that this is a voluntary opportunity for municipalities to take specific areas uh, within their catchment and require that builders build to a higher standard, they can then allow builders to, as I said before, dip their toe in the water, take on a small volume uh, project uh, where they would um, either use the expertise that they already have, or they would recognize very quickly that if they're gonna build to step code level three, for example, that they would need to go out and get this education. Of course, then they can apply that back against their CPD credits for their licensing requirements. I want to I'll flip off of a question that Brian um, or Anushko, I'm sorry, Brian, uh, asked about uh, about windows, and that is uh, the higher steps of the step code and of, of other programs, uh, Passive House and so forth, do require uh, some pretty high performance building products. And I'm, I'm thinking about glazing and windows uh, in particular. 
uh, that, that uh, are those products uh, easily available uh, in this market? Uh, and if not, would uh, the step code, if it was adopted more broadly, would it, would it drive uh, the creation of a, of a market or of an industry to, to build those here? Well, um, Bob, why don't you try? Oh, okay, go ahead, Gary. Well, I was just going to mention that um, a, a, a new initiative was just launched by the Ministry of Energy and Mines, um, whereby um, they are providing an incentive to um, window manufacturers uh, to uh, build and design and test uh, higher performance windows. So um, there is being some work uh, done in the market. Um, I'll leave it to Bob to uh, give an indication of what's readily available in the marketplace. So thanks, Gary. Yeah, windows are most one of my favorite topics of discussion. And really, when you're building a high performance <laughs> house, uh, windows are the, the most important element. And whether you're going to build a step code level one or a step code level five, I really would specify the same window because it's the one thing you can put into your house for the lowest amount of money that will not only improve energy efficiency, but will improve indoor air quality and thermal comfort. Uh, BC has uh, a wide variety of uh, local window manufacturers that, that build windows that come very, very close to the best windows that are currently manufactured in the world. While we don't have a lot of manufacturers locally who would necessarily build to the pinnacle, which would be the passive house standard, uh, because they have a very, very high standard for thermal performance. Uh, we do have uh, you know, more than a dozen manufacturers who can get very close. And interestingly, when you look at a standard window package, uh, the cost to go from a code minimum window to a triple glazed high performance window, which would be probably double the thermal value, um, is likely less than 15% uh, on the total cost of your windows. So um, it, is, it is the lowest cost place to improve your house. Um, but to Gary's point, what we really need in the marketplace, if we really want to move this forward, is we need, uh, you know, the, the unicorn of windows is a, an R10 window. Right now, uh, most of our really great windows are hovering sort of in around an R6. If we could uh, improve that to R10, um, they would dramatically reduce the cost of high performance housing um, and, and make the outcome a lot easier. Yeah, I think it's important that to recognize uh, that the, the window is, um, uh, something like a hole in the wall. It's it's the least efficient element within the house. Even even the best windows are still way way behind the uh, insulation performance of your walls. That is an entire other webinar, I think, uh, in of itself. <laughs> our yeah. uh, our passion with floor to ceiling windows and uh, bringing the outside in and so forth is also letting uh, energy out. So. Uh, but I think we're going to need to wrap with only a couple of minutes left. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you very much, Gary uh, Harmer of BC Hydro and Bob Deeks of RDC Fine Homes, and also Renee and Jessica, who've been working backstage to keep everything going smoothly, uh, and all of you out there uh, who have joined us today from across the province and the country. Um, I'd also like to once again give a shout out to BC Hydro. Thank you for supporting uh, today's webinar. We have one more poll question going up. Uh, feel free to answer that as you exit. And uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone. And we hope to see you again next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.